My name is Frank Cornelissen. We have a family winery in the northern valley of Mount Etna, where we started in 2001. My story doesn't start here. Mm, this building, um, we started in 2009. And, uh, the initial cellar was in a really small place, an old cellar part. Um, we started in 2001, which was the first harvest. Here, the bottom section, we and, uh, we and, uh, we took into our operation 2009 and uh, 2010. It was, uh, let's say. Uh, correctly installed. It was pretty small. I think in, the, in those days we made about um, 25,000 bottles. So right now we have also the upper floor, and, um, uh, which we, and, uh, which we put, and, uh, put together two years ago. And, um, uh, and you know, from this vintage, 2020, I think it's, an, um, uh, it's practically operational now. So you know, it, it takes a long time before uh, I would say you have an, an operation that, and, uh, that works. It's like 20 vintages and uh, 20 harvests, and right now things start to, uh, to fall together, which is quite, at least for me, it's, an, um, it's quite a long, uh, a long period. <laughs> I'm very impatient by nature. So, you know, story and, uh, of myself is... Uh, it's quite different, you know. I'm, I'm not a, I'm not the son of, an, um, of a, a wine producer, um, which, uh, and in, in itself, it then has an, has a few advantages. You know, you don't get a heritage under which you have to follow by force of nature, and so I, you know, I kind of made an, um, uh, the processes and then invented them myself. As for the area, I could choose the area, which I really which I really liked. So I wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't necessary to take over an, a winery in that space with those techniques, which and, um, uh, is great. And, uh, on the other hand, you know, it takes, an, uh, it takes a, long, uh, a long time also to get established in a market that people understand what, you know, what you're doing. So you know, that's, an, uh, that's the downside. So in, uh, in the end, it's, um, uh, it's been a quite, an, it's been a long process. In 2000, I, uh, I came to Etna, I saw this place, and I, I fell in love with it. It was just, everything in, um, made sense. You know, stone walls, the, in, uh, the old vines, uh, Etna, it was made uh, the first time, and there was still snow on the, on the cap of, an, um, uh, of Etna, Etna, which was absolutely fantastic. And so, uh, then gradually asking um, um, uh, things to local people. And, uh, I understood that then, uh, the harvest is late, which means vegetable cycles are late and long. And, uh, so everything fitted. Uh, and, you know, and I knew that it, uh, it was the place to, um, um, to, to produce wines. So obviously in, uh, in 20 years, <laughs> Etna has changed a lot. Meanwhile, I think 2002, yeah, um, uh, Mark de Grazia came here. He, and, uh, he bought an, uh, a winery, an existing winery. Uh, Andrea Franchetti also and, um, uh, was here in 2001. Actually, <laughs> we were neighbors and, uh, in, in a complete and, uh, valley in the northern valley of Vietnam. There's enough space. And uh, so, you know, finding yourself and then uh, being neighbors, and, uh, that is, uh, you know, that it, it's like destiny and, uh, in some ways. So it was, an, uh, it was fantastic, and um, the old days and, uh, were just absolutely incredible. Right now, you know, Etna is booming, and uh, we're talking about Etna, especially the Northern Valley, of being an, um, uh, in one line that, uh, with, with AOCs like, an, uh, like Barbaresco, Barolo, Brunello. So, you know, it, um, it is very strange to, to see such a, such a fast evolution um, uh, of, uh, of a wine area. So here we, and, um, we bottle, we label, and, uh, or we, and, uh, we put them, uh, the, the bottles away and, uh, for longer storage, like a single vineyard wines, and they are labeled afterwards, which we've done with, and, uh, with this wine also. 
So, you know, this an, uh, it's an evolution. So I would say it's 20 years of evolution. And uh, so what's my story? I think we're at uh, the halfway of my story. We're, uh, we're constructing also a new warehouse for, um, for the aging. So it, everything takes an, um, uh, enormous amounts of, uh, of time. So I think in 15, 20 years, I might have made a circle round. So these were the amphoras where in 2009 we started with. This was basically um, the tool for ant fermenting in the old cellar, the first cellar we had, which was in Solicata, a very tiny place. It was about the size of, of this room, plus then the, the outside space. And so I took those amphoras and built them into this into this level of the cellar, which is a little bit higher. And, it, you know, it worked really well. And, uh, but then, the, uh, already at the, at the end of the first year, and, uh, I noticed that the temperature was not cool enough. And so I put this, let's say, these panels in here. Then afterwards, we, uh, we still needed the, the, the whole room to, uh, to be uh, temperature controlled in, in order to, take, to, to keep the temperatures low during the summer because, you know, we are in, Sit in, uh, in Sicily and although this is underground, um, uh, temperatures when they go up uh, to 24, 25 degrees and, uh, in the cellar are too high to, um, uh, to keep the wines, you know, nice, crisp and fresh and for a longer time. So the evolution of the wines was a bit too fast. So I decided instead of um, having temperature controlled stainless steel tanks, we use fiberglass tanks which you also see in this room. And, uh, so, you know, it's, an, uh, it's a good mix. So right now, the, an, um, the, the amphoras, which in the beginning were not coated, now they're, um, uh, they, they are coated. We rarely use them. And uh, we've got one wine for a friend of mine, Cave Hox, and um, uh, he's, uh, he's my best man from, uh, from the wedding. And he's, he has an Osteria, and so I make his, an, uh, his, uh, his house wine in, uh, in these amphoras. So I use them either for small projects, wines for, uh, for my friend, um, uh, Sandro, and, uh, and that's basically it. So this, this is like a little bit my private, I would say my private cellar, my private kitchen to, one, uh, to, to make wines. Plus then also the fiberglass tanks that, uh, that came in here because we, we had them and so we, and we still can use the, uh, the, the amphoras. It's a little bit cramped, but uh, it's nice, it's cozy. It's, uh, it's the cellar in the cellar, let's say. It's, uh, and it's still useful, honestly. But obviously, the, you know, the, the amphoras, and, um, uh, I would need, I don't know, and, um, uh, hundreds of them, <laughs> basically, to, uh, to do the same work, which I do in, uh, in, these, um, uh, in these vessels and uh, the, the fiberglass tanks. So let's go and um, uh, back outside, and uh, I would say we go to the vineyards and and, uh, and see um, a few vineyard sites, which actually is the place to um, uh, where we make the wines, because the wines in our case they come out of the vineyards. That's the um, uh, that's our, um, uh, the the real the the real and serious importance of um, uh, of our wines. So let's go to um, uh, Fulu di Mezzo Sotana. The lower, or the lowest vineyard we um, um, we have. It's a nice location, also with a spectacular view on uh, on Etna. So, cellar is uh, located centrally, uh, in the middle of the uh, the northern valley. Uh, the vineyards are spread out throughout uh, the the whole complete valley, which means, in our case, between Lingua Glossa, which is a, a small town, uh, until. Randazzo, which is also the end of the, the AOC of, uh, of Etna, where the AOC stops in, the, in this valley. So it's, it seems to be a little bit of a complication to, uh, to manage many different sites. There's some more than it's like 19, it's, I think it's basically 20 sites, plus the ones we will plant this year. And uh, although you, you know it, it, it's not a big it's not a big deal and, um, because you know we grew gradually in, into this and um, after ten years it seemed to be 
quite a cost and then um, a complication right now. I think it's an asset um, because the wines are so different and, uh, from side to side and that's not an elevation uh, issue. It's, um, it's a subsoil issue and, um, like you have in Burgundy or in Barolo, Barbaresco. So it's, it's more site related and obviously with an extra dimension which is the elevation which means <clears throat> for for, for wine lovers, it's a bit more complex and that because a great vintage in, um, uh, on Etna could be a great vintage in the Northern Valley on the lower sides uh, rather than the, on the higher sides. And, um, plus you have the eastern uh, slopes of Mount Etna and the southern side. So it is, an, um, uh, it is very, very different and, um, uh, and uh, that, makes, that makes it interesting. And, um, in many ways and it's also exceptional. So here we're driving down towards the valley floor. We've got an extinct volcano which is in, uh, in Moyo, this crater right in front of us. Um, and so you see that it's not just a monoculture and um, it's all vineyards. So you have like uh, olive trees, and, um, uh, you have lava flows, uh, there's Mediterranean um, uh, bush, uh, you have vineyards and them uh, hidden behind or intermingled. In, um, uh, it's a bit, it's a bit old style. It's and um, uh, I like it. It's very, it's very nice to see. You got new plantations, old vines. Uh, so it's it's an, uh, it's a mix of um, of everything, which makes this place also quite dynamic. Uh, Twenty years ago, when I arrived here, many of the vineyards were abandoned. And people ripped them out and then started to plant the olive trees in the middle, and, uh, which is never a great, uh, never a great idea because it it makes the olive picking and um, uh, quite complicated. But you know, it's nice as um, uh, as it is much more of a polyculture. So here we're in the valley floor. We're we're approaching the um, uh, the vineyard. Ferro di Mezzo. There it is. impressive site. It's Etna right in front of us. The vines are about 40, 40 years old. It's uh, it's strangely enough it's one of the younger vineyards except the ones we just planted or last year's planting and this year's planting but uh, these are relatively young vines and um, it's a it's a productive site. Uh, it gives wines of great elegance, although we're lower in the valley, and one might think this is a site which gives wines with big structure. And uh, but you know we and, um, we didn't have that, and um, uh, we never had that this in in, in this site. So and, um, uh, strangely enough, this is and uh, it, it's a, it's a bit more of a, um, uh, a complicated side to, to figure out and um, uh, wines have an elegance and um, uh, are not blockbuster wines although they're lower down in the valley where you you expect the the, the full-blown opposite so this is I like this side and I like the wines so here we on um, you see we already did the you know, the, the work in the, in the in the vineyards we open up in um, uh, after the harvest and in, uh, in let's say early to mid mid December when the vine shuts down its an, um, its vegetal uh, vegetative cycle then we on um, we do an, uh, a plowing on um, uh, with an, uh, to open up the, uh, the soil you see the stones the the rocks on the surface it's they're not big and um, uh, they're more it's more rich there's more soil here in uh, in uh, in this uh, in this side which is very different compared to other sides so here the the pruning will uh, will be done 
in a week or so. So this, um, um, it's not a particular or peculiar site for pruning because it's still quite ventilated. And so we don't have an, uh, much frostbite and uh, problems here. What we did have in, uh, in a few on, um, on a few vines, and we, uh, we indicated them in, uh, in red, like you uh, can see here. This year we had Esca, some vines, they, they took some um, uh, diseases. So here we marked them in red so that we, and, uh, when we do the pruning, you don't get your, uh, put your, um, uh, the, the pruning scissors in here and then you bring the disease into uh, other vines. So like there, there's others, another one, there's another one, that one. So those are pruned with, uh, with different scissors or they're disinfected with, uh, with alcohol right away. So we, uh, we're doing this since the last, um, I would say three years, we're paying much more attention to, uh, um, uh, to the vines uh, because of a um, uh, small, I would say, climate change and um, where the vines are a bit more subject to, uh, to, uh, to diseases. Really beautiful day today. Actually too beautiful. <laughs> it should be snowing today, but it's not. All right, I would suggest we, uh, we go see another one, uh, a little bit the opposite. And uh, let's go to one of the higher sites, Barwabeki, which is at an, uh, 900 meters elevation, 870, 910, and, um, uh, where everything is terraced. So here, this is on lines, the, uh, the other vineyard is terraced on the, on, uh, on the higher slopes. Okay, we arrive in Barwabeki. I'll get out of the car here. You see all the terraces here uh, compared to on, uh, the vineyard we came from, uh, which was uh, on one single surface. See, there are small terraces because the uh, the steepness of the hillside, and uh, that's why also bush vines are the only right way to one uh, to plant here uh, because of the, uh, the the space so this is the um, uh, these are old vines planted before the first world war uh, they're not very thick uh, um, because of the rocky soil and, uh, underneath so here we work with the rototillers tractors to to go through and here We've already pruned in, uh, in this vineyard and, uh, in December. I'll, I prefer to prune here and, uh, early on because then you anticipate at least a week in maturation because as we are here on, uh, at 900 meters of elevation, it's difficult to get the, the, the maturation ripe. So um, imagine, uh, imagine we, uh, we, we pick here at, let's say the last week of, an, uh, of October to um, let's say first week of November. Although also that has changed the last, uh, I would say the last six years, we've, uh, we've picked here always the last week of October, which is pretty late and, uh, anyway. So what we do also here, we, um, uh, we fill up the, the missing gaps as this is an, uh, an old vineyard. We, um, uh, we take the same cutting wood, we make the vines and then we, um, um, we, we plant them ungrafted in, um, uh, in these missing sites. So here we've got one, two, three, four, you see the, uh, the, the smaller ones. So we continuously maintain the, uh, the, the same DNA from here and we reproduce the vines from this, uh, these old vines into the new, uh, into the new ones. So what's my approach on, uh, on winemaking? I would say it's uh, simplicity. And, uh, Taking out the, uh, the unnecessary, the excessive part, and uh, concentrating on, on the essence, which is obviously grapes. So, you know, great grapes and um, uh, top quality grapes means, in, uh, in our case, old vines, low yields, healthy cultivation. So we're, on, uh, we're organic on, um, uh, farming since day one. Um, trying to do no tilling but that didn't really work in, in all the sides so the vineyards are a very important part on the winemaking let's say an, um, uh, it's 
hands-on winemaking without putting too many hands into the wine. So we try to use an, um, as much also as um, uh, natural, uh, if you can call it natural, but natural logical techniques. Like for example, we've got two tanks um, outside now for, uh, for the decanting because the winters are not very long, but they are nice and cold up here. And so these two tanks, they, uh, they fit perfectly well to, to decant a rosé because it's the wine that you need to bottle the, uh, the, the fastest. And so we use the logics of the, of the climate where we are, the area where we are, to an, um, um, in, in for some techniques. So I'm not against technique, neither am I against technology. I, I like it as long as it fits a purpose, you know, using it just for the sake of it. That's not really my style. So when, uh, we, uh, we started with a little bit by, by trial and, uh, and error in uh, 2001 and then gradually we we're using the amphoras. Afterwards we're using these tubs so we can do punch downs. They're sitting on pallets and um, uh, they, they can be cleaned and uh, everything is, and, um, um, uh, is, is you know, is, it should be tidy. You, you cannot have a mess around, no chaos. I don't like chaos, I don't like dirtiness. So everything has to be clean and ordered. And so this comes in perfectly well. You know, you can um, do very small batch work and the temperatures are low in fermenting. And, uh, and so I, I like to use this a bit cumbersome, a bit more elaborate way of, of working. But then we also have the, um, I'm not saying high tech, but um, uh, tools that, um, uh, that um, uh, can make you one, um, uh, crank in one day through uh, 25, and, um, uh, 25 tons of, um, um, of grapes, which, you know, it's, uh, it's not a little bit. And, uh, and so we have the, the people, we have the setup, and we can do various things, um, um, uh, very specific small batch working, also bigger tanks and uh, bigger work. For example, we, on, um, we work here where the, we have the reception of the grapes um, uh, and then we, on, um, uh, we use this sorting table which is on, uh, exactly in line for, um, uh, with the outside and, uh, and then we also use these tanks and all these tubs which are way much larger than their, um, uh, than their deep which is great for fermenting and so we use these both for fermenting and now for storage afterwards. So also here in this colder place of the cellar, we've got the rosé decanting. So we've got now a, a, a cellar on two levels. We can work in, uh, really well on the, uh, the rosé in, uh, in the coldest part of the cellar right now in the winter. Then downstairs, more protected are the reds because they need a longer storage. And the whites are sitting in a very cold part between 10 and 12 degrees and, um, uh, for, for aging and storage so that the wine shapes and forms more gradually and then slower so yeah it's an um, it's not a very complex system it's uh, it's very very basic but what, uh, what I do like over time is that um, uh, we invest mo much more lately in um, uh, in equipment because equipment is needed for example if you've got a destemmer it looks like a normal destemmer but it's a modified destemmer to our standards because I like the berries to be more intact we use on uh, crushers and them, uh, which are separated from the destemmer because I prefer to have them uh, right on top of the, um, uh, the, the recipient with the uh, peristaltic pump. pumps. We, um, uh, we've got at least two per floor. So here we've got a big pump. We've got an, um, uh, a lobby pump because it, uh, it works nice when you do the, uh, the, the rackings of, uh, of the wine. So yeah, it's an, um, uh, it works. And uh, many of the tools are, are tailor-made and I, uh, I like that. And that's also nice. I'm a, I'm a big fan of mechanics, and so you know, it's it's a little bit my play garden with all the uh, all the tool and equipment, and it's uh, no, it's fun. So, what wine do I like? Personally, I, I like wines, as I said, and, um, which have a, a territorial identity, and so. Um, we and uh, we that means and uh, me and my wife, uh, but also in the cellar, with the team we and uh, we drink, we taste a lot of different wines. And, um, uh, again, wine with wines with personality, and with a territorial identity. So it's it's very broad. You know, it's like asking what kind of music do you like to hear. <laughs> it's, it goes from Joy Division to Shostakovich to to Bach. 
So it's very diverse. And the same thing with wine. You know, I, I'm not fixed and focused on only natural wines or only wines from the Jura or from Burgundy. No, I'm, I'm very curious by nature. And I, and I like to drink and, um, wines that I don't know. So if I, ha I see a wine list and I, I, I see a wine or an area, from an area where, um, um, which I never tasted, I'm, I would rather take that than, uh, than, than a, you know, um, the classic or, um, uh, or a wine that I, I do know. So and, um, there is this temptation, this curiosity and, um, uh, with wine. And then, you know, there's an, uh, still, I would say, an influence from, from a classicism and, uh, for, for two reasons. And, uh, mainly because I grew up with great classics, thanks to my father and mother. And they, um, they allowed me also to, to empty my savings account and buy uh, really great wines in the, in the 70s, which were affordable, and, uh, fortunately. Um, and so I, I, I have a tendency to taste them back now after 20 years of, um, um, of winemaking myself to see where are we compared to the, the, the classics of, um, uh, of the old days. So it, it, it's very broad, and, uh, but I have a tendency to like and, um, uh, Barolo, Barbaresco. I, I love Lange, I love um, uh, Piemonte, uh, but also great Burgundy. Is, and, um, uh, but, and, um, uh, you know, maybe... Funny enough, for uh, for some, I, I do like uh, Bordeaux. I love great Bordeaux, especially the the the, the 70s, 80s Bordeaux are are fantastic and um, wines, and so I think they represent also a territory in, um, uh, in, a, in a very very precise way. And, uh, wine for me is an um, has has a sense of place, and um, that is most important. It's what I, uh, I want to produce, but it's also what I like to drink. So wines that represent territory uh, are, uh, are important. It's a bit old school or old world and, uh, in some ways, because, you know, talking with the with, with enologists or wine producers from, and I would say, the new world, um, there, is an, um, there is also an, a, a different way of looking at things. You can also make wines in a cellar, which is an expression of a vision, and a concept which is more person-related um, or technique-related. Like, for example, a vin jaune in, um, uh, would be something I, I really like to drink a vin jaune, but I would never like to produce it. A little bit like the, uh, the, the skin-fermented orange wines. I um, personally um, um, I like to drink them. I love drinking them. <clears throat> but I don't want to produce them because it becomes technique and much less territory. So uh, in order to do that, obviously you need to have man. You, you, you have to make decisions. And so you cannot say um, it's territory only. And, uh, no, you, uh, you have to have an idea, a concept of how to, um, um, you can show the, um, um, uh, those grapes and interpret them into wine in the best possible way. And so that has been a process which has taken time you know, that over the last 20 years, I think. It, and, uh, my technique has also uh, grown and has changed and, uh, in order to be more precise in, in the work. So uh, that is the, the, the goal and the vision and that, that will be, at least in the, for my generation, and as long as I'm here in, the, in charge, will be, on, uh, will be the, the goal. Afterwards, you know, it's up to the kids to to decide where do they uh, they want to go with with uh, with the winery and the uh, and the expression of uh, of territory.